Hello, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us for our Maundy Thursday service. Maundy Thursday is the day before Good Friday, which we celebrate when Jesus gathered his disciples for Holy Communion, for that last supper around the table before he would take and be taken to the cross. And we also think of the many other things that Jesus taught his disciples, especially where he washed their feet and tried to teach them a deeper lesson about servanthood. And so we give thanks that you're here with us today. I'm Pastor Schoen, pastor here at Word of Life Lutheran Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to contact us. In the description below, you'll find a number of different ways online that you can contact us, whether by, by email, finding us on Facebook or our YouTube page. Whatever we can do to serve you, please don't hesitate to ask. We do want to remind everybody that tomorrow night, April 2nd at 7 p.m., we hope and pray that you can join us online, streaming either here on Facebook or on our YouTube page for our Good Friday evening service at 7 p.m. And then on Easter Sunday, April 4th, we hope and pray as we'll be returning to in-person worship that day that you can join us either here at Word of Life or you can continue to stream our services at both 8.30 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. So we hope and pray that this service is an encouragement and a blessing to you.
Jesus when you are in your kingdom. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today on this Maundy Thursday as we think about the message that your Son gave to his disciples and all of us. In those last few moments he had before the cross with them, Lord, he taught them many things. But tonight, Lord, we look towards his example, what he actually did, not just his words, that they might take that message and example with them, and we as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. And Gandhi said, find yourself in the service of others. Martin Luther King equated greatness with the ability or the opportunity to serve, with that heart message of how we go about and interact with other people. And Gandhi said, we should have a life so much so of servanthood that whenever we look up, we just find ourselves naturally serving other people. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight as we think about our Lord and Savior. And we think about that Maundy Thursday. There were a lot of things that went on as Jesus gathered his disciples for that last supper, that last meal, the opportunity to celebrate communion with them. And then those teachings that he would have with his disciples before he was arrested and taken to the cross. We want to look at the example of Jesus as a servant leader, a servant king. Even though he was a king, even though he was Lord, he still wanted to let the disciples know that he had no problem serving. And he wanted them as well to take that message that they would serve other people once they became leaders in the church. We see a lot of leaders in our world who are willing to serve other people. There's even an entire branch of leadership theory on servant leadership. And a number of colleges, not just here in America, but around the world, have created curricula that talk specifically about how to be a servant leader. Think about the last time that you served somebody else. How did it make you feel? And how did it impact other people? 
That is the question, that is the challenge that Jesus is going to give to us in our text from John's gospel that we're going to read in a couple of minutes. But the message of what Jesus is trying to get us to understand and that we're going to see brought out in this text is that if leaders can serve, if leaders can be servants and leaders can serve, so should we. If leaders can serve, so should we. And it's going to go even further And Jesus is going to go a little bit deeper with that understanding that good leaders or great leaders don't just do something for somebody else, they do something to somebody else. And I'm not talking about assaulting somebody, but they impact the life of the people that they serve that those people might walk away with a message of encouragement, a message of hope, a feeling of being welcomed, loved, cherished, that they too would want to go and take that opportunity, take that message of what they have seen, that way in which they've experienced that compassion, and live it themselves. And Jesus is calling his disciples to that message. See what I have done for you, and not just for you, but to you, on a deeper level, and use it as a springboard to continue to serve other people and to do things to other people, to impact them. And the challenge is going to be extended to all of us as we follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we follow his message. So if you know the story of Maundy Thursday, if you're familiar with what happened on that Thursday before Good Friday, before Jesus is taken to the cross, Jesus gathers his disciples and he gathers them for a meal. Now they didn't think anything very specifically about this meal. They didn't understand what was coming. But Jesus wanted this time, this opportunity to be very special for them. And as they're gathered around and they're talking and they're jockeying for position around the table to be closest to Jesus probably, Jesus is watching all of this go on and he's watching them probably argue a little bit with one another. And he wants to focus them because he's got a teaching for them and it's not just something that he's going to say, it's something he's going to do. Now John records and the way he writes or structures his gospel Half of his gospel actually occurs from Palm Sunday through the resurrection. So half of his gospel, or a good chunk of his gospel, is just structured in one week. And there's a big chunk of that half that occurs just on Maundy Thursday evening. There's a big chunk that is filled with just teachings from Jesus, these last-minute teachings that Jesus wants his disciples to see, hear, and understand, that they can take those messages with them, Wherever the Spirit leads them, calls them to be, interacting with other people, raising them up in the gospel. And Jesus teaches not just with his words, but with his actions. And so as he's seeing all of the disciples kind of gathering around and talking and, and kind of doing all of these other things, he wants to focus them for the deeper meaning of what his actions are going to do. And so one by one, He starts to wash their feet. And they must have been in shock to see their leader, their rabbi, doing this. Now, they had seen him do plenty of miracles. They had seen him do plenty of healings, plenty of teachings. Be compassionate. But they probably didn't expect it at this moment or in this way. And if we were there, we could probably see the room just get a little bit more silent as they see or watch Jesus doing this. And we watch the disciples, and we watch their actions, and the way they're observing this, and receiving what Jesus has done. And so here's where our text follows up, or this is where our text takes place in John chapter 13, after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. When he, Jesus, had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, He said to them, do you understand what I have done, not for you, do you understand what I have done to you? Real leaders, great leaders don't just do something for somebody else, they do something to somebody else. They create an impact, a lasting change within the heart of those whom they serve. 
And that's exactly what Jesus was trying to do. Do you understand what I have done to you? Because I don't think they understood what he was doing to them. And I wonder how many of us truly understand what Jesus has done, not just for us, but continues to do to us. So many of us live our lives where we just focus on what Jesus has done. But we should also be focusing on what he does to us, the impact that he makes upon our hearts for lasting change and lasting opportunities to serve other people. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to not just do something for us on the cross that we could not do ourselves, but through his teachings and through the ways in which he interacted with so many people and continues to interact with you and with me, he wants to do something to us. He wants to impact us in such a way that we want to do and we want to respond in the way that he has served us. Do you understand what I have done to you? Do we really understand and do we take to heart what Jesus has done to us? Have we been impacted? Have we been changed? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Now, Jesus wants to make this very clear to the disciples. Even though he's serving them, He hasn't completely taken away his place as a leader. But he's bridging this concept of leadership and service. And he rightly wants to get the disciples to understand that even though he's serving them, they should still be looking at him as rabbi. They should still be looking at him as leader and as teacher. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If I, as a leader, can serve, so can you. And that's what Jesus is saying to all of us. If those in leadership can serve, if we're looking towards our leaders as servants, then we too can lead as well. If we're looking at Jesus as our Lord and as our teacher, but we also look at him as a servant, then there is no reason that we should not be serving as well in a lot of different capacities. Jesus expects all of us to follow his example. He expected it of the disciples as they're there experiencing it, and he's expecting all of us who follow him to listen and do as he has called. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done, not for you, I didn't just wash your feet to make them clean, but I did something to you. I impacted you, or I am calling you to be impacted by what I have done so that you will take that message, embody it, and live it. And I find it interesting, as we look through history, we think about the value of servanthood and how great things have come from different servants and people who have been leaders but also have been servants. Think of Jared Butler. He's a basketball player. He plays for Baylor, and they're making a big run in the NCAA tournament right now. Jared Butler is the leading scorer on the team, leader in the locker room. But on Sundays, he's at a local church teaching Sunday school. Not only is he a leader, he's also a servant, willing to teach and willing to submit and willing to help out. In 1879, Charles Edward Pickering was the head of Harvard's observatory. And the observatory was in charge of kind of uh, looking at constellations and kind of mapping the stars. And he had this team under him that really wasn't doing too much. And and he was getting tired of of what the people weren't accomplishing or weren't able to do. And, And so he's looking around at other people. Well, there was this Scottish servant, Williamina Fleming, that he had. And he saw something in her, and he invited her into 
his lab. He invited her to become a part of the team. She started kind of as clerical secretary, uh, but then he started seeing what she was able to do more and more, and so she started uh, elevating herself, and she started being elevated and, and started being able eventually to be head of all of the analysts that were there. And even though she started as a servant, and that's how a lot of people had seen her, her humility and her servanthood were a means to show everybody something more. Part of the moon today is named after her. The way in which we classify stars that we still do today is based off of her work and what she did and what she instituted. She discovered many multiple nebulae out there in the cosmos. And there are a lot of servants just like her who are using their opportunity to serve to impact change in other people. And to show that just because you're a servant doesn't mean you can't do and accomplish great things. Real leaders don't just do something for somebody else. They do something to somebody else. They impact them that their lives might be changed. If you're familiar with the the TV show Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Will Smith plays a troubled teen um, who goes and lives with his aunt and uncle far away from where he had kind of grown up and, and where he had gotten into trouble. His, his uh, mom wanted to remove him from those situations, those dangerous times and those dangerous places. And, and so she uh, sends him to live with, her, uh, uh, with his aunt and uncle in Bel Air. And in the pilot episode, as Will uh, meets his, his, his aunt and uncle um, for the first time in a number of years, and he goes to their house, they have a butler named Jeffrey. And Jeffrey is British, and you, if, you know this, if you know the show, you can hear in his, his uh, very British accent, Master William, he continues to, to, to refer to Will, Master William, Master William, in this pilot episode. And you're going to see it continue throughout the course of the show. Well, in that very pilot episode, uh, after about the third or fourth time of Jeffrey calling him Master William, uh, Will says to him, look, you, let's think of something else for you to call me. I, I don't want you to call me Master. And Jeffrey says, in order to keep the proper relationship between a butler and those that he serves, I have to call you master. And so he continues to call or refer to William as Master William throughout the course of the TV show. And I think it's interesting or telling about how we see our Lord and Savior. Jesus in this text is saying, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus is willing to see each and every one of us beyond those who are in subjection to him. He sees us beyond those whom he has just created. But he sees and views us as ones whom he loves. And as he says multiple times, has considered friends. And much of the theology of the New Testament after the Gospels, as the leaders of the church are reflecting back on who Jesus is and what he has done, reflect back on that relationship that Jesus had with his disciples and Jesus continues to have with all of us. Where it's not just all about us calling Jesus master. But Jesus wants all of us to be in a fellowship and a relationship with us. He wants us to be in relationship with him where we see him as more than just the creator of the universe, the creator of the stars. But we see him as a close and personal savior, one who loves and cares for us and will do anything for us that we might have life, that we might be encouraged, and that we might have the fullness of what his blessing is. And so I find it interesting, as I, as I think about that pilot episode of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and this Master William, this, this, this set-apart relationship, yeah, there is a way and a time 
which we call Jesus Lord, and we call him teacher, and we don't dispute that. But the connection that we are called to have with our Lord and Savior goes much deeper than that. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Where he doesn't just do something for us, he does something to us. He impacts us at a way that is completely different than if he was just Lord and creator and demanded that we have complete subjection to him. That, that's the great relationship that God has through Jesus Christ with all of us. Jesus was personal. Jesus was charitable. He was compassionate. He was, quote unquote, down to earth, literally. But he was conversational. And he wanted to have a relationship with those whom he had created. And he understood that when he came into this world, it wasn't just going to all be about who he was as God. But he understood that through servanthood, he was going to be able to accomplish great things. And he was going to be able to teach in such a great way. Are we thinking along those same lines? Or are we thinking in that way? The challenge is the same that Jesus had for the disciples as it is for us. Go and do something not just for people, but to people. Impact them in such a way that they are changed. Jesus changed those disciples that night. He continues to change each and every one of us. And it's not just because he is Lord and author of creation, but it's because he continues to serve. We give thanks for Jesus and all that he has done. May we do likewise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping here at Word of Life Church in Naperville. We now worship the Lord through our giving. To give tithes, offerings, or to donate and support, you can do that on our website at www.wordoflife.net. Or you can simply just text the amount that you would like to give to 630-949-3892. And follow the prompts to set up your giving for easy, simple, and secure future giving. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer. As we think on the servant nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we think about John's gospel and the way that he tells us about Jesus, we're going to flip forward into the New Testament, into one of the letters that John himself wrote to the church, also reflecting back even more fully on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here is what John says to all of us in 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world." 
What a wonderful message and a wonderful reflection on what Jesus has done for us and the way in which he has served us. Let us go and serve others as well. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the example of Jesus. We give you thanks for all of the wonderful things that he has not done just for us, but also to us, the way he has impacted us and called us to something deeper, something greater. Heavenly Father, we think of the examples of so many leaders over the course of time who have not just led and governed, but have also served. Heavenly Father, may we follow their example and serve others with great diligence. Lord God, Heavenly Father, on this Maundy Thursday, we know that in these few short hours, your son will be handed over to death. We think about the impact that should have on us, knowing that it is our sins, the sinfulness of the world, that caused him to be born into this world, to live a life that was perfect, that when he died, we might be freed from the penalty of sin. Help us to understand that as we reflect over these next few hours on what Jesus has done. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there are so many who are sick and hurting in our world, even in our congregation, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, whoever it might be, Lord, we pray that you would heal them and hear them. And for the sake of your great mercy and compassion, that you would heal them as they need. Lord God, Heavenly Father, We think of all of those who are broken in spirit, those who are suffering at the hands of anger and frustration of others, whatever the rages of the world might be against them. We pray that you would comfort them and encourage them through the struggle. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for deliverance. We pray for deliverance of all people, that the Holy Spirit would work in such a way that people would open their hearts to receive what only you can give. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we think of all of those who continue to travel and will be traveling over these next few months. We pray that you would keep them safe no matter where their travels might be. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that in just a few short days now on Easter Sunday, we will be returning to in-person worship here at Word of Life. And we pray that you would help us in these last few days in the way in which we plan, in which we evangelize, in which we seek to raise up people to join us here for a great celebration, the triumph over the devil, over sin, and over death. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for Easter and beyond. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for our preschool, we pray for our planning, we pray that you would bring many students and their families here to hear your message of salvation. Lord God, Heavenly Father, for these prayers and all the other prayers that are on our hearts, we lift them to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we close our Monday Thursday service in a couple of minutes, we are going to have a final song, and then we're going to have the reading of Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is what Jesus quoted when he was on the cross, and we see it as a prophecy about what our Lord and Savior is going to go through on that Good Friday so many years ago. And so as we close our service and we think about all of the things that Jesus has done, not just for us, but also to us, we want to take time to reflect on Psalm 22 and the agony that meant that we would have life.
Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it.